God's saying, in essence, Israel provoked me to jealousy by worshiping idols and things which weren't me throughout history, and then most recently, rejecting the way I made for them to have that intimate relationship with me, which is the Messiah Jesus. And so the way I'm choosing to express my jealousy to them right now is a Gentile body of believers whose faith is recognizable to Israel, where Israel goes, wait a minute, that belongs to us. What's this intimate relationship you have with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Welcome to A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. I'm your co-host, Carly Berna. And I'm Ezra Benjamin. We're a Jew and a Gentile who both believe in Jesus and believe that there's value in looking at history as well as today's world in the headlines through both a Jewish and a Christian lens. Just a heads up before we dive into our topic today, Carly, you know, A Jew and a Gentile Discuss is listener supported and we want to give you, our listeners, an opportunity at the end of this program to get more involved. So stay tuned for those details. Let's discuss. Well, Ezra, today we're going to talk about a topic that we've probably been thinking about since childhood, which is jealousy, and not my jealousy of your new house or your fancy car or that coffee that you just drank. It was delicious, and you should totally be jealous of the coffee. Yeah. You should. But the jealousy that's referred to in the Bible, and the verse that we're going to look at today comes from Romans 11. I'm going to read it, and then if you could explain just the context of the verse, and then we'll get into jealousy. Right. So it says, um, this is Romans 11, verse 11 to 12. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So what is what's happening here? Right. At this time. Yeah. And the question is, who is they? Right. I think sometimes whenever we want to quote a verse where it says, therefore, you know, the, the my college president used to say, you have to ask what the therefore is there for. Otherwise, you're just adding your own context. And then they, in this case, is Israel. And what do we mean by that? The state of Israel? No. Jew- Jewish people living in the land of Israel? No. This, this is Am Israel, to use the Hebrew, which means the people of Israel, the entirety of Israel the people who are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob living in the world at that time and by application at this time. We, we heard a Bible teaching recently, Carly, actually maybe a week or two ago, where the person said, I, I always loved Romans 1 through 8. And then, you know, it's about being more than conquerors and God's love for us, right? And who can separate us from his love? And, and then you get to the end of chapter 8 and you fast forward to chapter 12 which is offer your bodies as living sacrifices, right? Holy and pleasing to God and spiritual gifts and submission one to another. And that's all wonderful. But people get to these pesky three chapters in Romans 9, 10, and 11, and we don't really know what to do with them because it feels like it gets super specific and we go, what does this have to do with us? So let me try to answer that before we interpret the verse. Paul was speaking to the Roman church, maybe 80 or 90 AD, you know, give or take a few years, but decades after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, okay? And the church at this point, let me say by church, I mean the, the body of believers living in and around Rome that this letter is to, is predominantly Gentile. Before you turn off this podcast offended, what do we mean when we say Gentile? That just means not part of the Jewish people, not part of uh, Am Israel, the people of Israel, okay? So these people don't have a Jewish background, they don't have any Jewish heritage, but they've heard the gospel, the proclamation of the good news of Jesus the Messiah, and understood that they are separated eternally in their sin from God, they have no relationship with him, and that they can have that relationship and that salvation and that abundant life and that eternity with him through Jesus. And they've received that message, they've received that good news, they believe, they're justified by faith, and they become part of this this local expression of the ecclesia, the body of Messiah. It's a fancy Greek word, but that's what it means, in Rome. But this church, this local body, like probably many others in the Mediterranean or in the known world at that time are going, wait a minute, we're hundreds if not, you know, hundreds of if not a thousand kilometers outside Israel and Jerusalem. We don't really know a lot of Jewish people. We don't have any Jewish background or heritage. And every time we talk to Jewish people in our town about Jesus, they seem to reject him. So what do we have to do with the Jewish people? And what does God have to do with the Jewish people, right? Like all of these questions are starting to swirl and maybe you're listening and if you're from a Christian background, you can relate. 
Maybe some of these questions are what you think of when you start to read Paul all of a sudden going from talking about being more than conquerors to talking about this deep, gut-wrenching heart burden he has for the salvation of Jewish people. And you go, forget it, I'll fast forward to chapter 12. Well, we're not going to do that today. We're going to hone in on the verse you read and talk about the context and then talk about this super, I'll say inflammatory word called jealousy. Right? Like, am I supposed to, I thought I'm supposed to be a good Christian, which means loving everybody and doing justice and righteousness. And then Paul says here, Israel has rejected Jesus, but God hasn't rejected them, right? Did they, Israel, stumble so that they would fall? Meaning, did they, did they, is this the last straw for God? Right? Is he done? Like, this is it. You've turned away from me in every generation. Now you rejected Jesus. I'm done with you. And that's really where the idea of what we call replacement theology comes from. And we talk about that, Carly, in other episodes. This idea that the Jewish people have rejected Jesus. And so consequently, quid pro quo, God has rejected the Jewish people and formed this new entity, called this new enterprise called the church right, which is a Christian religion. And if Jewish people want to convert and become Christians, that's great. But God's done with Israel as a people, right? There, there's no more destiny. It's all canceled. That's replacement theology in a nutshell. And Paul's going after that right here. He's saying, wait a minute, is this an irrevocable stumbling, like an irrecoverable fall for Israel? No. It says by no means, some versions say God forbid, others say certainly not. So Paul's saying that's not at all what's going on. And now to the issue of jealousy. He says rather through their trespass, through their sin, what's the sin? Not recognizing Jesus is the Messiah that we've waited for. We were expecting a ruling, conquering king, and we got a suffering servant. And because we couldn't see that that's really what God knew we needed first, before the conquering king would come, we missed him by and large except for a portion of the Jewish community in the first century who did receive Jesus as the Messiah. And he says, through that sin of rejecting the Messiah, salvation, Yeshua in Hebrew, salvation has come to the Gentiles, come to the rest of the nations, tribes, and tongues on earth outside of the Jewish people. Listen, so as to make Israel jealous or so as to provoke Israel to jealousy would be the literal Greek word there. And again, now back to that thought I started and didn't finish is, wait a minute, how, are we supposed to actually provoke someone to jealousy? I thought we're supposed to be nice and loving. How is it a loving thing to do to turn to the Jewish people who I heard I'm supposed to sort of stay away from and let them believe what they want because it's politically correct not to, politically incorrect not to, and I'm supposed to actually get up in their business and provoke them to jealousy. So. So before we go on, let's yeah. talk about what is jealousy. Yeah. I know like growing up, there was this idea of envy versus right. jealousy. Like what is this word talking about when they say jealousy? Right. I think there's like, there's envy and there's resentment, right? Resentment is I'm frustrated about or with somebody else, right? Something's just bugging me about them. And then there's envy, which says, you know, that person has the fancy new car and I want a fancy new car, right? It's somebody has something that I, that I wish I had. But jealousy, by definition, is a much deeper word. Like, and actually, if you, if you think of it, you can, I, when I think of jealousy and what would cause me to become jealous, Carly, I almost like feel something in my gut. I know that sounds super odd, but it's like this gut reaction. And what it is is saying, somebody's enjoying an intimacy of some kind that belongs to me. That's jealousy. Right? And just like think about that wherever you're at, whatever your family context, whatever you're, it's not saying, ah, oh, you know, they, they got a raise, I want a raise. Or, you know, they got a new dog, I want a new dog, right? Or they won the marathon, I wish I won the marathon. It's they're enjoying something intimate that actually belongs to me. I have rightful claim to it and somebody else has it. That's jealousy, right? It's, it's like, even as I say it, like I can feel this sort of, you know, rumble in the gut like it's a deep uh, maybe it's one of the deepest human experiences or emotions mm -hmm. that's jealousy and god's saying okay israel rejected israel committed the trespass of rejecting the messiah jesus by and large and so i'm i'm saving i'm bringing everyone else into relationship with me and what is salvation yeah it's personal forgiveness of sins but it's being brought into intimate relationship with the god of israel right with the father through jesus so he's saying i'm going to bring everybody outside of israel into intimate relationship to enjoy with me to provoke the people to whom it belonged in the first place to jealousy 
Like it's a deep thought. I, I remember the first time someone, um, a friend of ours actually, yeah. said to me that our role as Christians was to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And I that was such a strange thought for me. Like uh-huh. I'm sure I've probably read this verse, but just right. went right past that part and didn't really like study word for word what uh-huh. it meant. But what... Like, what does that mean, provoke to jealousy? I mean, I think it's pretty easy to provoke someone. Right. But provoke to jealousy, I think there could be a, a real thin line there of how do you just provoke a Jew versus provoke a Jew to jealousy. Right, exactly. And that's an important distinction, right? Because throughout history, there's examples we can think of of where uh, Christians, either well-meaning but ignorant or misinformed, or even the institution of the church in a particular country or region has just provoked the Jewish people. Like, think, you know, yes. may, irritate them, make them angry, sin against them, right? That's provoking. But that's not provoking to jealousy. And yet Paul's saying, actually, it's it's part of your role, right? That's That's how I'm reading this. Salvation has come in order to, for the purpose of, Right? And people go, well, wait a minute, Is, are, are Christians just pawns to, for God to get what he's after with Israel? No. God so loved the world, that, and the world is the world, all tribes, tongues, and nations, Israel and the nations, that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever, Jew or Gentile, believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We have that assurance in the scriptures. And yet, this idea of, of jealousy and it being part of Christians' job as redeemed, saved men and women to provoke to jealousy, what, is that, what does that actually look like? And how do we do that in a way that's not perceived as, I'll just say it, I'll use the A word, anti-Semitism, like you're telling me I can't and shouldn't be Jewish anymore. No, that's not the message. Or you're telling me your religion's better than mine, like some kind of religious superiority. No, that's not the message either. What does the jealousy look like? And I think, Carly, the the best way we can go after this, because like you said, sometimes we read scriptures and we go, that's weird, that's hard, that's not understandable. Moving on, give me something, you know, I can take to bed as a devotional thought, right? Okay, so digging in and not letting go of this uh, this difficult issue of jealousy for a minute, what right does God have? I'm going to use that language. That's like super strong language, right? But what right does God have to use Christians to provoke Israel to jealousy? And the answer to that actually, I think, has to be part of our own understanding of the Jewish people. So I'm, I'm appealing to our Christian audience now, and actually I'm appealing to our Jewish audience, because the scripture I'm about to read was written to Israel. Okay, so this is, and we see this language a lot throughout the Torah and the prophets, but I'm going to read one passage right from near the end of the Torah. Okay, so near the end of Moses' first five books of the Bible that he's penning before he dies on on the mountain and and Joshua and company march into the promised land. God's speaking through Moses and he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. He says, they, Israel, has provoked me, they have provoked me, God, to jealousy by what is not a God. He's talking about the idolatry and Israel who belongs to him. It's a holy people actually practicing pagan worship. So Israel's provoked me, God, to jealousy by what is not God, and they've moved me to anger by their foolish idols. Then listen to this. Think about Romans 11. God says, so I'll provoke them, Israel, to jealousy by a nation, who, by those who are not a nation, or by a people who is not a people. And I'll move them to anger by a nation considered foolish. And it says, a fire is kindled within me. So that feeling we feel when we think of being jealous of someone or jealous for someone, like an intimacy that belongs to us being in the hands of being enjoyed by another person, God's saying, no, 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 you, you don't know the millionth of it. I have a fire burning in me because I always wanted intimate relationship with Israel. That's what I was after. I was making a way through the commandments I gave them for a holy God to be in intimate relationship with a chosen people, and they are literally worshiping. They're, they're practicing the most intimate thing we can do, which is worship, except they're worshiping other gods and idols on the top of mountains, and they're making me jealous. So tie that back to Romans 11. God's saying, in essence, Israel provoked me to jealousy by worshiping idols and things which weren't me throughout history, and then most recently rejecting the way I made for them to have that intimate relationship with me, which is the Messiah Jesus. 
I'm jealous. A fire burns within me for Israel. I will have them. And so the way I'm choosing to express my jealousy to them right now is a Christian community, or in essence, a Gentile body of believers whose faith is recognizable to Israel, where Israel goes, wait a minute, that belongs to us. What's this intimate relationship you have with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Ah, well, we have that through Jesus, our Savior. Well, he's our Savior. Well, if you want him, come and get him, right? That, that's what's going on here. It's God, in essence, it, it, it feels fierce, but jealousy is fierce. I think that's the hard lesson in Romans 11 here, is God's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to get you to want me like I've wanted you throughout history. And I'm going to use the Gentiles to do it. The people you considered not a nation. The people you considered having no relationship with me. I'm going to give them relationship with me and my goodness and mercy. And it's going to provoke you to jealousy. So before we talk about what that looks like yeah. tactically, right. like for the Christian audience, just I have a question for you, Ezra, because yeah. you're a, a Jewish believer. So sure. he's talking about Gentiles provoking Jewish people to jealousy. But right. I guess I have a two, two questions for you. One, before you were a Jewish believer, were you ever provoked to jealousy? Or was is that too early on in your days? Totally, I was. I can remember little tinges of it. And again, like I, I came to faith around 13 years old. Okay. Ish. Uh, but yeah, I can remember those moments of going, wait a minute, these, these, these Christians have something here. Like it, they're really connecting with God. Like what is going on here? And then going to, you know, my Passover seders at my family's house going, we're going through the motions, but I don't feel like we are connecting with God. We're trying, like we're giving it our darndest, but something is missing here. And then realizing, oh, Yeshua is the answer. He's, he's what the Christians know that, that my people have rejected for so long, but if we could know what they know, we could have what they have and more. So, yeah. so okay, that makes sense. So now that you become a believer in Jesus, that's not considered a Gentile, but do you now provoke people to jealousy? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think our job as Jewish believers, all, all of our job, I'm thinking of Romans 1.16 here, is to go first to our own people. And we understand that there's like this scriptural principle that because there remains callousness, blinders on our hearts and our eyes, where even when we hear the gospel, many of us can't receive it until the Lord removes those blinders. There's like a spiritual blindness Paul's talking about. Because of that, we can first hold out the good news to our own kinsmen according to the flesh, very biblical language, but Jewish brethren in any city where we're proclaiming that good news, where we're sharing our faith, many of our people will reject that and so then comes in what God was always after for the Jewish people to be and to do from Genesis 12 on when he says to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you. And he says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So yes, it's my job to provoke Jewish people to jealousy or at least to hold out the good news as one whose blinders have been removed and who now enjoys abundant life through our Messiah Jesus. But it's also a critically important, irrevocable part of our calling as Jewish believers to actually hold out that good news to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So therein lies the maybe sometimes hard to understand or misunderstood truths in scripture that Paul's talking to the Romans about. He's saying, and he's saying to Jewish believers, if all the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus, go be a blessing, right? God, uh, Yeshua says to the disciples before he ascends to be with the Father, he says, go and make followers of me. Go and make disciples of all nations, starting here in Jerusalem and then going to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So he's saying, go fulfill Genesis 12 in me. And then he's saying to the Gentiles, fulfill what God's after from Israel by provoking them to jealousy through your own abundant faith, through your own abundant life. So we each have an irrevocable part in what God's after in the other. And I think it's designed that way. Yeah. So what, is, what does it look like to provoke a Jew to jealousy? So I'll just make this really practical for yeah. someone listening that has a Jewish neighbor. What three things can they do to, quote unquote, provoke a Jew to jealousy? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you three, but I'll tell you some of what isn't necessary. And I'm, I'm hitting on something tender here that, you know, maybe it'll ruffle the feathers of some of our listeners. But 
understanding the Hebrew roots of my Christian faith, if I'm a Christian, right, is super important. It's devotionally meaningful. It helps us enjoy a deeper intimacy with, with the Lord. It helps us understand the story we've been a part of. But provoking a Jewish person to jealousy does not mean learning how to shout to your neighbor, Mr. Goldstein, Shalom Aleichem, right? Like, and get my Hebrew phlegmy accent down. And it doesn't necessarily mean understanding what Passover and Easter have to do with each other. That's good. But understanding your own Jewish roots isn't synonymous with provoking a Jewish person to jealousy. And what do we mean by that? Before I give you three specifics, the main headline idea is, do I have a faith that's recognizable to a Jewish person? Like, what's the language I use? Am I a follower of Jesus, the God of the Christians, who invented a new religion around 0 AD and asks people to convert to it? Or is my testimony, man, I was without God in this world. I had no relationship with the Father, parentheses, the God of Israel. And Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, made a way for me, a Gentile, to be grafted into his family through the faith of Abraham, which is faith in Jesus. And which is, you know, God, God made me righteous through, through his son. And he can do that for the Jewish person who's been cut off. And he can do that for the Gentile who never had a part in the tree apart from Jesus. Like, it's biblical language, but it's maybe so different from the way we tend to describe our faith. So just to be clear, I shouldn't take my shofar out onto the street and blow it. You know, you could. You're going to provoke someone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you're going to provoke them to jealousy or if you're going to provoke them to call the police yeah. or to tase you or what, depending True. on what city you're in and its yeah. local politics. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not the Jewish things that we do. It's what's, what's the story? Like, I guess that, that's my question for our Christian audience. What's your story? And I mean, like, you have your own individual testimony, but what is the story that you've been grafted into? Because Paul says its roots and its fatness are the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what you've been brought into as an olive branch that's been made a part of this tree, though you originally weren't a part of it. And our, our appeal to, our, to the Jewish community is if God can bring me who had no part into the olive tree, he can certainly bring you who had a part and who've been removed because you couldn't see the Messiah, he can bring you back in through faith. So it's, is the way I talk about my faith recognizable to a Jewish person? Three things practically is, you know, God promises, he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus says, right? But I've come as the Messiah, as the shepherd of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? So that you would have life and have it more abundantly. So if you're enjoying an abundant life, just live that out in the, in the sight in the view of your Christian, ex or excuse me, of your Jewish extended family, Jewish coworker, Jewish neighbor, people are attracted to light and they're attracted to life. And while we understand as a Jewish people, maybe God exists and maybe he has a plan for us and somehow we're called chosen, many of us, most of us aren't necessarily enjoying an abundant life. In fact, we would say we have a lot of doubt and uncertainty about this life and certainly what the future holds. So you living out an abundant life is a way to, you know, and certainly describing that as, yeah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made a way for me to have an abundant life in his son, Yeshua. It's like, er, record scratch. What are you saying? That sounds like me language. Well, it is. It's always been for you, right? That's, that's a provocation to jealousy. Um, and again, I think part of, your, part of your faith expression, if you have the chance to share your faith with a Jewish person, isn't, hey, Jesus wants you to become a Christian. Do you want to pray a prayer with me? It's, hey, I see in the scriptures how Jesus, your Messiah, said he came first for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I'm so thankful he brought me into his family too, but I see he was first coming for Israel. Right? Like it's, it's a different way than the way we talk about the gospel, and yet it's totally biblical language. Okay? And that's what Paul was saying to the Romans. And then thirdly, they'll know we're believers by our love for one another. I think, and it sounds so cliche, right? And it sounds so simplistic. It's a difficult topic, Jewish ministry and how to share the gospel with a Jewish person. But uh, I think genuine love, people perceive that. And as much as people want to criticize your faith, if you're a Christian who's sh who shared with a Jewish person, and as much as they want to say, Jesus isn't an option for us and that's for you, and why don't you just stop telling me about this? It's making me uncomfortable. Or they might be thinking it's provoking me to jealousy. When times get tough and something hits the fan and there's a crisis, so often you hear Jewish neighbors go to the Christians and say, would you pray for us? Would you, can I just confide this in you? Because they feel genuinely loved and cared for. And 
one of our good friends, you know, who's also in Jewish ministry, says people don't really care what you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. So start with love. Even though I ended with love, start with love. Demonstrate genuine care. And that's not just the niceties of I should care for people. I would say if, if you're listening to this and you're going, I want to connect with this, but it still sounds kind of clunky, uncomfortable for me, ask God for a little bit of the love and the compassion he feels toward the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ask him to deposit that in you and see what happens. Yeah, that's great. Like I said, I think the first time that I heard that our role is to provoke the Jews to jealousy, that was an overwhelming concept. Right. So I hope this was helpful. And um, the challenges that Ezra just talked about, the three ways you can um, provoke your Jewish neighbor to jealousy, think about those, pray about those, ask God about how you can do that. Or maybe if, to even find a Jewish neighbor, maybe you don't have a Jewish neighbor that you know right now. Um, but ask him to bring someone into your life that you can have that opportunity. And then share your testimonies with us. We'd love to hear that yeah. as, as you try to live that out. So tune in to listen to us next week, and we'll talk to you then. If you benefited from what you heard today and you feel others could benefit from hearing it too, we want to ask you to get involved and become a supporter. $50 gets this and other important messages out to a broader audience and gets life-saving medical care to one additional underserved Jewish person living far outside the land of Israel. As a thank you, we'll send you a bag of fresh roasted Ethiopian beans from our own Lost Tribes Coffee Company. These delicious beans are responsible for both the speed and intensity with which Ezra expresses himself on this podcast. Totally true, Carly. And if you're not ready to become a supporter today, just let us know that you listen by entering and giving a little bit of information. You'll be entered in a drawing to win a free bag of that Lost Tribes Coffee Company coffee. You can go to our website at jewandagentilediscuss.org or click in the show notes for more information. And if you want to hear more episodes, subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast content. And we'd also love if you leave us a review and share this podcast with someone you know. You can also follow us on social media at the handle A Jew and A Gentile Discuss. And if there's anything you want us to discuss or have us answer, please submit your questions at our website, A Jew and A Gentile Discuss.org. This is Carly and Ezra. Thanks for listening to A Jew and A Gentile Discuss. Join us next week for another episode. This show is a production of Jewish Voice Ministries International.